Hello, my name is Maritania Sivero. I'm from the University of Seville in Spain. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about covano homotopy type uh, via simplicial complexes and presimplicial sets. So uh, I want to, to say thank you to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this classical notes, um, virtual notes uh, seminar, and especially to Sujoy because he is a collaborator and also friend. So thank you to all organizers for the invitation. And uh, thank you uh, all of you for watching the, the video. So I'm going to, to start sharing my screen. Uh, yes. Uh, oh. Okay, so this is the title of the talk, Kovanov homotopy or Komotopy type via simplicial complexes and the simplicial sets. Uh, and today is November 26th, but uh, this is an asynchronous seminar. So I know you will be watching this in the future. So let's go. This is the, the structure of the talk. Uh, I will start by giving a, a quick explanation on homology and homotopy type, but, but very quick explanation. And then uh, in sections two and three, I will explain uh, some constructions that we have done which simplify uh, this construction by Lipsis and Sarkar on Kovanov homotopy type. So let's start. Okay, so why do we study Kovanov homology? Uh, what is Kovanov homology about? So it was introduced by Kovanov in around year 2000. It is a bigraded homology. It has two gradients, it is a link invariant and it categorifies Young's polynomial. In the sense that the Euler characteristic of Kovanov homology equals Young's polynomial of a link. Uh, it is a stronger invariant than Young's polynomial. For example, here we have two knots. And if we compute the Jones polynomial, this is taken from not atlas, the Jones polynomial uh, is the one you can see here. But if we compute the Kovanov homology tables, they are quite different. They are like that. Okay. Here, the as I said before, Kovanov homology is a big gradient homology. So we have two gradings. The first one is the homological grading uh, I, and this is indexed by these green numbers. And the second one is the one we call quantum grading. And uh, it's uh, this J uh, is indexed by these blue numbers. So as you see, Kovanov homology tables of these links are um, different. But when we consider the Euler characteristic of this, uh, this homology, we get that these red um, pairs uh, cancel each other. So at the end, we have the same Jones polynomial. Okay. So uh, Kovanov homology detects the unknot. It detects a trivial two component uh, link. And well, from Kovanov homology, you can compute the same variant, which provides a lower bound for the slice genus of a knot. And uh, with it, uh, with the S invariant, you can give a combinatorial proof of the topological mid conjecture. So uh, it is quite important to study Kovanov homology. So let's see how do we construct it. So uh, we need uh, a chain complex where these are uh, the abelian groups, the chain groups, and we have some maps, some differentials, okay? And then once we have this, we just take the quotient and what we get are the homology groups we are looking for. So what we need to know is how to construct this chain complex, how to construct the Kovanov complex. We need to define who are the chain groups and what are the differentials. So to do so, we start uh, by recalling what are Kaufman states. So if we have a diagram D, we can consider this uh, application, this S from state, associated to each crossing a label either a zero or a one. So for example, if we have this, uh, the regular diagram of the trefoil, we have three crossings that I have called them Z1, Z2, and Z3. So this is a state. I say that to cross in one, I associate the label one, to cross in two, we associate label zero, and to cross in three, we associate label one. So um, this is a state. 
we can encode them uh, as a, well, states can be seen as elements in this queue, okay? Uh, and if we have an order in the crossing, we can encode them as a vector of, since we have three crossings, so three coordinates. So this will be the state 101, and I write it that way, okay? So once we have a crossing, we can we have a state. Sorry, we can smooth each crossing by following its label. So if we have a crossing with a zero label, we smooth it that way. And if we have a one label in the crossing, we are going to smooth it that way. Okay. And for me, it will be very important for the future that we keep track to uh, the, of the place where there was a crossing. So I will add this small little segment here. The blue one means that we have a smooth by following a zero label and the red one means that we have a smooth by following a red a one label. Okay. So this uh, if I do this to this state, <coughs> this diagram following this state, I smooth Z1, C2, C3, uh, C1 following a one label. So you see that I smooth here and I get this red segment. And well, you do the same with Z2 and Z3, and that is what you get. At the end, what you get is a set of, of circles, of topological circles in the, in the plane. They can be nested or not, and some segments in the places where there was a crossing. They can be red or blue, depending on whether you have a smooth, a zero or a one crossing, okay? Um, I can consider other state, for example, the state associating a zero to every crossing. And the picture you get in this case is something like that. So these are Kaufman states. And once we have that, we can consider uh, a cube associated to the diagram. Uh, in this case, we have three crossings. So it's a three-dimensional cube. In general, it can be a, well, you have at the end two to the, C power uh, number of states, where Z is the number of crossings of the, um, of the diagram. So in this case, we have all possible states associated to the trefoil. We have three crossings, so we have those eight states. We have zero, zero, zero. Now in the next column, I have written states having just one, one label. So here we have zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, and one, zero, zero. In the next column, I have drawn all states having two one labels. So one one here, you see zero one one, one zero one, and one one zero. And then in the last uh, column, I have written the states having three ones. Okay, the only one that this one 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 state. Also, something that uh, it's important is that here I'm connecting two states if they differ in just one coordinate where the one in the left has a zero and the one in the right has a one, okay? So for example, zero, zero, zero is connected to those threes. But for example, here, zero, zero, one, I can change the first zero by a one, so I will get this state. And this is the reason why this is connected by an edge. And zero, zero, one, the second zero can also be changed by a one. So in this case, I have zero, one, one, and this is the reason why I'm connecting those two with an edge. From 0, 0, 1, I cannot go to 1, 1, 0 by switching just uh, one label. So I cannot connect this one with this one by an edge, okay? So edges are, uh, are arranged that way. And now uh, what we are going to do, we are going to consider V, which is a graduate vector space having two generators, V minus and V plus. And the degree of generator B minus is going to be minus one, and the degree of generator B plus is going to be plus one. So I'm going to associate a copy of B to each of the circles in a state, okay? So since here I have two circles, I have a copy of V for the outmost circle and a copy of V for the innermost one. So here I have the tensor product of B times B, okay? Here, uh, I have just one circle, so I have just one copy of V and so on. Here, I have three circles, so I have a copy of V for each of the circles. Okay, so the chain groups of Kovanov complex, the chain groups are going to be uh, considered, uh, are going to be taken, um, well, you can see them here. The first one is just V 
tensor product V, so we get this. In the second uh, group, we have V plus V plus V, so we have this, and well, you see, okay, this is the way uh, you construct the, the chain groups. And now we need to define differentials. So in order to define differentials, notice that when we uh, have an edge connecting two states, we are changing a zero label by a one label in a color scene, okay? So when we do this, since we have smoothed the crossings, we have passed from this situation to this one, okay? The smoothings has changed. They have, let's say, as if they had rotated, okay? And depending on how the strands are arranged, how the endpoints of those, those four endpoints are connected, we have two possible situations. Either we are merging two circles into one when we change zero for one, or if strands are arranged that way, we are splitting one circle into two, okay? So in the first case, we are going to define M is going to be a multiplication. Here we have two copies of V's because we have two circles and here just one. So we say that V tensor product V goes to V. And uh, we say that we are going to define M in terms of, we need to define it uh, in the generators of V, okay? So we say that V plus times V plus goes to V plus, V plus times V minus goes to V minus, and the same for V minus times V plus, and V minus V minus goes to zero, okay? So this is M, it is defined that way. And here we have a copy of V because we have one circle, which is mapped into two copies of V's because here we have two circles. So again, we say V plus is mapped into uh, this uh, term and V minus is mapped into V minus times V minus. So the differential is defined on each edge by either M or Delta, okay? And well, uh, we have to sprinkle some signs so that it is really a differential. So the composition is zero, but we won't go into that. So going back to our example, this was what we had before and differentials are going to be defined that way. So for example, here we have just one circle and it is split into two circles. So we apply a, a co-multiplication, we apply Delta. And here from this state, for example, to this one, we have a circle which is not touched, it is preserved because the, the change, the, this modification is happening far away of this circle. So in this circle, we have the identity and in the purple circle, we have this one is splitting into two circles. So here we have this multiplication, okay? And this is how, how differential works. We take the sum over all those edges, the sum over all of those for this D, and yes, this is how it works. And this is command kind of complex. It depends, of course, on the diagram. And uh, we say that uh, quantum homology was a vibrated homology. So where are those two gradings? The first one, the I degree depends, is the homological degree, and it depends, uh, well, you see it's in the complex, it depends on how many R's you have, meaning how many ones you have. Recall that in each column, uh, as you move to the right, you are going to have one more one label. So this is the homological gradient, okay, I. And J is the quantum uh, degree, and it depends on the number of positive mar uh, crossings, negative crossings, the number of ones in the state, and also the inner degree of the element you have, because recall we are, uh, V is a vector, a graded vector space. So it has, each element has associated a grading. So this grading is contributing to this J degree, okay? So with that, uh, we uh, can take the quotient. And what Kovanov proved uh, was that these, are, these uh, groups here, these homology groups here are linking variants. So they don't depend on the, on the diagram, they depend just on the link. And these are Kovanov homology groups. So this is uh, Kovanov homology in very, very few uh, words. This is the definition. 
And now let's see how uh, we recover quantum homology uh, from, uh, sorry, Jones polynomial from quantum homology. So here we have uh, the trefoil, mm, <coughs> the trefoil knot, and its quantum homology table is this one. Okay, so this means that when h equals zero and j equals three, we have a z. Okay, and for example, when i equals three and j equals seven, we have z mod two. Okay, so if we want to uh, recover Jones polynomial, we just have to take the Euler characteristic, characteristic of this uh, homology. So we just say, for example, here we have uh, um, this term, this z is contributing uh, minus one to the third power, meaning negative sign, times q to the ninth power, meaning q nine, and rank is one, so coefficient is one. Okay, for example, this yellow one is contributing minus one to the zero power, meaning positive sign, times q to the third power, meaning q3, and rank is one, so we have this q3. And that is how we recover Jones polynomial from quantum homology. So, um, Lipschitz and Sarkar introduced a refinement of quantum homology, and they call it a quantum spectrum or quantum homotopy type. Uh, his paper, in fact, was uh, his, his title was a Kovanov homotopy type, their first paper on the subject, and it was uh, published in 2011. And what they did in very, very few words is uh, starting from a diagram, they associate it a um, spectrum that they call Kovanov spectrum in such a way that the homotopy type of this spectrum is a link invariant. And even more, the cohomology of this spectrum equals the Kovanov homology of the diagram, okay, of the link, let's say. So, uh, some properties of Kovanov homotopy type. If the link is alternating, then uh, Kovanov spectrum is not giving us more information than Kovanov homology. But in general, it is a very much stronger invariant than Kovanov homology. Okay, so for example, here we have two uh, knots uh, with uh, 11 crossings. And this is following uh, Rolfsen's table, Rolfsen's notation. So uh, their Kovanov homologies are the same, but their Kovanov spectrums are different. Okay. It is not a complete invariant. For example, those two knots, this is Kinoshita Teresaka knot, and this is a mutant of uh, the other one. So if we compute the Kovanov spectrum, they are homotopy, their homotopy type is equivalent, okay? So uh, it's not a complete invariant. It behaves well under cobordism, behaves well with disjoint union and connected sum. And in general, uh, this Kovanov spectrum is not a wedge sum of more spaces. So uh, Kovanov spectrum is a very, very, very powerful uh, link invariant. It can give us many geometric and topological information about the, about the links. But uh, if we want to compute them, uh, let's say by hand, if we want to really compute this, uh, the remote of type, it is quite complicated. So what I'm going to introduce you in the next two sections uh, is uh, let's say a simplification on, of this Kovanov spectrum, which works just in some special ratings. Okay, so uh, let's introduce uh, extreme geometrization. And to do so, we need to explain first what are extreme ratings. So imagine this is the Kovanov homology, let's say complex, not Kovanov homology tables, but Kovanov complex. So we have something like that. When we move to the right, the I index, the homological index is increasing. And when we move uh, up, the J index is increasing, okay? So it grows when we move up the J index. Okay, so we are going to say that J mean it's going to be the minimal value of J so that there exists a state of the diagram having this J index, okay? So remember, each state has an associated an I index and a J index. So compute all the states associated for the diagram and uh, compute the J index for all of them. So the, smaller, but the smallest value of J is going to be this J mean of the diagram. 
okay? So this is J min, and well, J almost minimal, meaning uh, the next to the bottom index is going to be called J all min, okay? And we know that it is this value, J min plus two, because in these rows, you always jumps by two units when you go up or down, okay? So you can do the same from the top. Uh, this will be J maximal, J max, and this is going to be J all max, meaning almost maximal rating. Okay, so to the first one, to the top one, and to the lowest one, to the bottom one, we are going to say that these are extreme gradings, okay, extreme common homology gradings. And to the other ones, to the second from the top and second from the bottom, we are going to call them almost extreme common homology gradings, okay? So uh, now I'm going to tell you uh, two geometrizations of common homology which in some sense are equivalent to that of Lipschitz and Sarkar, but they work, one of them works for extreme rows, for extreme common homology gradings, and the other one for almost extreme rows, for almost extreme common homology gradings, okay? And the first one is going to be, we don't need to go through a spectrum, we just need to have simplicial complexes. And for the second one, we just need to go through uh, pre simplicial sets. So, as you see, uh, these constructions are going to be much simpler and we can construct them very, very easily. So, let's go, let's define them. So, we want to geometricize this lowest, uh, this extreme common of homology rating, this extreme, yes, the, the last row. So, we start with a diagram and we want to construct a simplicial complex. And in the way we are going to consider some graph that is called Lando graph, okay? So uh, we have this theorem by Juan Gonzalez Meneses, Pedro Manchon and myself saying that the extreme common of complex of the diagram is a copy of the cohomology complex of this simplicial complex that we construct. So as a consequence, extreme common of homology of the diagram is a equals uh, to the cohomology of this simplicial complex. And this, well, uh, with this, you can simplify many computations. You can generate H thick links using that. And well, uh, since these are simplicial complexes, you can apply very well known techniques of simplicial complexes to the study of common homology. And something very interesting is uh, this conjecture of the, this wedge of a sphere's conjecture, uh, which has some, well, if, if it is true, it will have some implications in the study of these extreme rows of common homology. So let's see how do we make this construction? How does it work? So we start with a diagram and we are going to construct a graph from it. So the first thing we do, we smooth every crossing by following a zero label. So if we do that, we get something like that. Here we have a circle with six uh, blue Chords, the six blue segments come, each of them coming from one of the crossings here. And this is exactly the same as this. Okay, I just uh, draw, I have drawn it differently so it is clearer, this picture. Okay, so now we are going to say that a chord, meaning a segment, is admissible if it has both endpoints in the same circle. So in order to construct the graph, we are going to draw a vertex for each admissible chord. Okay, so since here we have just one circle, our chords are going to be admissible. So we have six chords, so we have here six vertices. And now we are going to draw an edge connecting two vertices if the endpoints of the corresponding chords here alternate, okay, along the boundary of the circle. So for example, here one and two, their endpoints, you see that they alternate. So we draw this edge with two and three you see that the endpoints of those two chords alternate. So we draw this edge and so on. If we do this with all edges, in this case, we will get an hexagon, okay? You see that, for example, one and four are not connected because here the endpoints of strand one and the endpoints of strand four, they are far away. They are not, um, they don't intersect, okay? Along the boundary. So uh, from this diagram, we have constructed this graph, which is called Lando graph. And now we just need to take the independent simplicial complex associated to the graph. And what is this simplicial complex? Well, uh, the 
we have a complex whose simplexes are just independent subsets of vertices of the graph. So let's see this example. Uh, well, we always have the empty set. Then we have vertices, one, two, three, four, five, six. And now we need pair of vertices, pairs of vertices in such a way that they are not neighbors. So for example, one, two, they are neighbors, so they cannot appear as a simplex here. But one, three, they are not neighbors, so they appear here. The same with one, four, one, five, and so on. You see two, four, two, five, two, six, and so on. <laughs> and now uh, the simplexes of dimension two are going to be triples of vertices in such a way that they are not neighbors, that they are not adjacent. So in this case, we just have one, three, five, and two, four, six. And that's it, because we cannot pick four vertices here in this hexagon in such a way that they are not adjacent. So this is the independent simplicial complex associated to this graph. And if you consider the geometric realization of this uh, simplicial complex, you will get something like this, okay? Here you have one, three, five, two, four, six, which are those two triangles. And then you have those additional edges, okay? So what we what our theorem says is that the extreme cohomology of this link equals the cohomology of this simplicial complex. Okay. Okay. So as you see, this construction is super easy. It's very easy, and um, there is a natural question because this was something that uh, I did while while I was a PhD student. And um, uh, to be honest, I didn't know about the, the work of Lipsis and Sarkar. So then, of course, when I presented this in a, in a conference, someone told me, do you know about this work by Lipsis and Sarkar? Do you know the relation with your construction? So of course, uh, I felt very ashamed that I didn't know uh, their construction. But then um, I was trying to, to learn it and to know what was the relation with this construction that I had. And uh, in fact, they are equivalent, right? There is, we proved together with Federico Cantero that there is a homotopy equivalence between Lichis and Sarkar construction for the extreme grading and our construction. Okay? So at the end of the day, they are the same, they are equivalent. Okay. So now let's go to, this was for extreme grading. So now let's go to almost extreme grading to the second from the bottom uh, grading. Okay, so in this case, we have a construction, but it works for semi-adequate diagrams. Semi-adequate diagrams uh, include alternating links and alternative links. This is a, a important and very, uh, very well-known family of, of links. Uh, semi-adequate links and we were not able it is not possible to associate them a simplicial complex but we could associate them a pre-simplicial set in such a way that the almost extreme common of complex of the diagram is a copy of the cellular chain complex of this pre-simplicial set okay this was a result that we uh, proved uh, together with joseph shitisky and as a conclusion, as a consequence of this, we get that, of course, the almost extreme common homology of the diagram equals the homology of uh, PD, of the presimplicial set. So let's see first what are semi-adequate links. If we have a diagram, uh, we can smooth everything by following an A label. Here I choose A instead of zero, but it's the same. A, a, uh, sorry, A smoothing is the same as zero smoothing. So we can smooth everything following an A label. And then we can construct a graph associated to this state just by uh, associating to each circle a vertex and to each we uh, connect two vertices with an edge if here we have a red segment connecting uh, the associated circles. So this is the graph associated to this state. Okay, so we say that the diagram is A adequate if we don't have uh, these kind of things, if there are not when we smooth every crossing following an A label, we don't have segments uh, with both endpoints in the same circle. At the level of the graph, this means that the graph has no loops. Okay, a diagram is A adequate if you don't have this situation. 
and a link is a adequate if it can be represented by an a adequate diagram. So you have the same construction for uh, B when you smooth every crossing by following a B label, you have exactly the analogous definition. And we say that a link is semi-adequate if it is either A adequate or B adequate. And we say that it is adequate if it is both A adequate and B adequate, okay? So our construction uh, works for semi-adequate links. And uh, we are going to explain it by choosing A adequate links. If the link is B adequate, then uh, you will get the same construction, the dual one, but instead, <coughs> Instead of having um, the second from the bottom, you will have the second from the top grading, okay? Okay, so we know what is semi-adequate. I'm going to recall you what are presimplicial sets. So a presimplicial set uh, is just a family, it consists of a family of sets indexed by an N and a family of maps from Xn to Xn minus one, satisfying this condition, okay? So this is a presimplicial set and they have a natural geometric realization. So if we consider the model simplex delta N, then uh, we consider this DI, uh, which just, uh, well, it goes from delta N minus one to delta N and it just introduces a zero in position uh, I, okay? The, in the I coordinate, you introduce a zero and push the I coordinate to the I plus one place. Okay, so the geometric realization associated to a presimplicial set is given by this formula. We take a copy of delta n for each xn, okay? We take this union, and then uh, we make some identifications. We have those gluing instructions that are given here. This is the relation that we are going to use to make some identifications, okay? We will see an example later. So this is a presimplicial set, but for us, we will need another uh, notion, which is partial presimplicial sets. And the only difference with presimplicial sets is that instead of these maps going from Xn to Xn minus one, they are going to be defined just in a subset of Xn that we call the domain of Xn, okay? And then here, when we uh, consider the geometric realization, we are going to keep this gluing instruction for those, um, <clears throat> those A's where this DI is defined, but when DI equals zero, meaning that uh, A is not in this domain, then we say that we collapse this to a new point that we add, that is the point B. Okay, so here we have to add a point B, a vertex B, meaning that we everything which is out of this domain, it's collapsed to B, okay? So let's see an example. Imagine we have this partial presimplicial set. So if we want to construct this geometric realization, we say, okay, we have three, uh, three elements in X1. So we have three, copies of delta one, meaning three segments, T1, T2, and T3. Here we have two vertices, uh, sorry, two elements, V0, V1. So this means that here we have two vertices, V0, V1, and this V that we have to add because we are considering partial presimplicial sets. And now with the differentials, if we make these identifications, we get exactly those relations that we have here, okay? So the first one, for example, tells us that the endpoints here, this one is going to be V1, this one is going to be B, well, and so on. You know how to glue the vertices to the endpoints of those segments, okay? And now if we just do the proper identifications, we get something like this. So we get that the uh, geometric realization of this partial presimplicial set is S1, okay? So these are partial presimplicial sets. So now I'm going to tell you how to associate to a diagram a partial presimplicial set in such a way that the homology of this partial presimplicial set equals the most extreme common homology of the diagram. So first we need to consider uh, the graph associated to the A state. Okay, so we start with our link diagram and here there is something wrong because this should be a figure eight knot, okay? 
So uh, we say that n, we define n as the number of crossings minus one. So here we have uh, n equals three because we have four crossings. And m is going to be the number of circles we have when we consider the a state, meaning the state associating an a or a zero to every crossing. So here we have three circles, so m equals two. And now we consider the graph associated to this state by collapsing each circle to a vertex, and we get this. And we are going to order those vertices here. Sorry, uh, we are going to... Um, uh, those vertices are going to be labeled from D0 till Tm. This makes sense because here we have m plus one circle. So here we have from zero till m. And now we are going to label the edges from V0 to Vn. And the edges are going to be ordered. Okay. So here in the edges, in the set of edges, we need to define an order. And the order is given by, by this rule. V0 is smaller than V1 and so on. Okay. And uh, the label you have here uh, comes from the order you define in the vertices, in the crossings at the beginning. Okay, so now we need to define the, the sets. So first recall that partial presentation set, we have the family of sets and then the maps. So we are going to define now the sets. So Xn is going to be uh, the set of those vertices, the zero, T1, till Tm, okay? And each of them at the end, when we consider the geometric uh, realization is going to, to correspond to an n-dimensional simplex, okay? So in this case, T0, uh, T1, T2, each of them is going to be a copy of those tetrahedra, okay? So uh, for K between zero and N, we are going to define Xk, in that way, the elements in XK are going to be K plus one tuples of edges of the graph in such a way that they are ordered and the edges not appearing in the K plus one tuple has to be parallel, okay? So in this case, X2, we had X3 before, now we have X2, so we need three edges in such a way that they are ordered and the ones not appearing in the tuple uh, have to be parallel. So since you are just letting one outside, you have all possible combinations. We have four edges, so we have four possibilities, leaving out three, leaving out V2, uh, leaving out V1 and leaving out V0, okay? Now for X1, we need a pair of edges in such a way that the other two that don't appear here are parallel. So since the only parallel edges are V2 and V3, we just have V0 and V1. This is the only possibility, okay? And X0 is going to be uh, the set, this set, okay? V0, V1 till Vn, where these are the, the edges. So in this case, these are the sets that we get for the partial presentation set associated to the figure eight diagram. And now differentials are going to be defined that way. The differential of Tj equals if <coughs> Tj is adjacent to, this is the i, so if Tj is adjacent to Vi in the graph, then we remove Vi, and otherwise this is mapped to zero, okay? So in our case, uh, D0 of D0, since V0 is adjacent to D0, to this vertex, we can remove it. The same with V1, we can remove it, but now D2 is not adjacent to D0. So we say that this is mapped to zero. And in the geometric realization, this would mean that this face of the tetrahedra is going to be collapsed to the vertex B, okay? And the same with D3, okay? So uh, if we consider T1, uh, well, in the vertex, you see that the only uh, edge that is not adjacent to T1 is V0. So that is the reason why this zero of T1 is zero and the other ones are okay, okay? So this for uh, T's for the differentials of I n. And if we want to define I k when k is between zero and n, what we do is the following. Recall that here we have k plus one tuples. And what we are going to do is if the, if um, <clears throat> the, um, 
<clears throat> the edge which is in position I here is parallel to the edges not appearing here, then we are going to remove it. And otherwise we map this to zero, okay? So in our case, for example, D2 of B0, B1, B2, we say, okay, let's say uh, the one in position two is B2. Can we remove B2? So the one not appearing here is just B3. So since V2 is parallel to B3, we can remove V2. So the image of this, uh, the image of this is V0, V1. Okay. But otherwise, everything is mapped to zero because we cannot remove any other edge in such a way that it is parallel to V3. Okay. And well, uh, V0, V1, V3, the same. We can just remove V3 because it is parallel to V2, but we cannot remove V0 nor V1. So these twos are mapped to zero, okay? And this is how uh, the partial presumption set is constructed. So in the case of the figure H naught that we were considering, uh, we construct the partial presumption set as I have just told you. And if we consider its geometric realization, what we get is the suspension of the projective plane. Okay. So now let me show you two very easy examples: the left-handed trefoil and the right-handed trefoil. And you will see that what you get is uh, are like the, the most extreme cases that you can get. So in the left case of left-handed trefoil, if we have smooth everything following an A label, we get something like this, three circles connected that way. So uh, the corresponding graph is a triangle. So here you have no parallel edges. So uh, X2 is T0, T1, T2, one uh, element corresponding to each vertex. X1 is V0, V1, V0, V2, and V1, V2, because remember that you can always uh, remove one vertex because it has to be parallel to no one. So you can always remove one. And X0 is V0, V1, V2. Okay, and now what are the differentials? So T0, you can remove, uh, uh, sorry, um, T0, it is not adjacent to V1. So this one is mapped to zero. And uh, well, you can remove V0 and you can remove V2. So you get something like that, okay? What that this means? It means that when we consider the um, geometric visualization, we have a delta square associated to the zero, meaning this triangle. So the fact that D1 of T0 equals zero means that we have to collapse the edge which is in front of B1, meaning this edge. We have to collapse it when we consider the geometric realization, okay? Uh, this is what with T0, when we do the same with T1, now we have to collapse the edge which is in front of V2, meaning this one, okay? Why? Because V2 is not adjacent to T1, so this was mapped to zero. And well, the same for T2, okay? And uh, well, the zero of those, you cannot remove anything because there are not parallel things. So you cannot remove anything from here. You have no two parallel edges, so you cannot get uh, all differentials here are going to be, sorry, all, yes, different face maps here are going to be mapped to zero, okay? So uh, this is what we get. And when we uh, do the geometric realization, we put everything together. What we get is that uh, the partial present visual set associated to this diagram has the homotopy type of the projective plane, okay? If we consider the right-handed trefoil, now the situation is completely different. If we smooth everything following an A label, we get two circles connected that way. And here, everything is parallel. So uh, when you try to do the same, uh, you can always remove edges because the ones you are removing are going to be parallel to the ones not appearing here. So this is the reason why this is really not a partial presumption set, but a real presumption set because nothing is mapped to zero, okay? So at the end, when you consider the geometric realization, you get those two triangles, one associated to each of the vertices. And uh, you have the, the vertices, uh, this is V0, V1, V2, nothing is collapsed. You do the identifications, you identify the, those edges. This is what you get when you um, do the, you follow the glue instructions. 
and what you get is S2. So uh, the homotopy type of the partial presumptual set associated to the right-handed trefoil, to this diagram of right-handed trefoil, is the sphere. Okay. So uh, our theorem was that if we have an A adequate diagram and we construct a partial presumptual set that way, the almost extreme command of complex associated to the diagram is a copy of the uh, cellular co chain, co chain complex associated to the geometrization of this partial presumptual set. And as a consequence, almost a stream of homology can be read from the homology of this presumptual set, partial presumptual set. Okay, uh, this is a result together with Joseph Shidisky. And this you can say, okay, but still uh, it is not easy to compute this homotopy type, right? You have to compute the partial presumptual set and then do uh, all simplifications to know all identifications to know the, the its homotopy type. But what is much better is that we were even uh, able to compute the exact homotopy type of the partial presumptual set. And this I'm going to show you in the next slides because I forgot that here I have something to show you. Just that the, um, the example for the left-handed triple, we got that. For the right-handed triple, we got that. And of course, it agrees with, uh, with common homology tables, right? Here we have Z, here we have Z2. So yes, things uh, matches as we expected. So what I was telling you before about the, uh, determining this specific uh, homotopy type, the homotopy type of this, um, <coughs> of this partial presumptual set, uh, this is what I'm going to tell you now. So we started with a diagram. We construct the graph associated to the A state. And if we have multiple edges, we remove it. We just uh, consider the graph as if it were simple, okay? And we construct this partial presumptual set. Okay, now let's say that this diagram has C crossings and this graph, its cyclomatic number is P1. Cyclomatic number is just the number of edges that you have to remove from the graph. So you cut all cycles, okay? The minimal number of edges you have to remove so uh, you don't get cycles in the graph. So the homotopy type of this, uh, this partial presumptual set that we get is, if the graph is bipartite, then it is a wedge of P1 spheres of dimension Z minus one. And if the graph is not bipartite, then you change one of those spheres by the suspension of a projective plane, okay? And this is the exact homotopy type of the partial presumptual set you get from the diagram, okay? If we, instead of consider the homotopy type, we are just interested in Kovanov homology, we can state the result that way. The uh, <coughs> almost extreme Kovanov homology of a diagram, these are the proper indexes, okay? Uh, the almost extreme common homology of a diagram, which is A adequate, it's going to be either Z to the P1 power if the graph is bipartite, or Z to the P1 minus one power plus Z2 otherwise. So this simplifies a lot of the things because if we take this diagram and we just have to smooth everything following an A label and construct this graph just by collapsing all cycles, what we get is this graph. So we see here that this graph is not bipartite because we have triangles. We just need to compute its cyclomatic number, which in this case is four. If we remove those four edges, then we cut all possible cycles. So almost a stream cone of homology of this knot is Z3 plus Z2. And this is how this theorem works, okay? And this construction is again equivalent to that of Lipschitz and Sarkar. Okay, of course, this one is just for almost extreme degree and semi-adequate diagrams and their construction is for all gradings and all links. But here, you don't have even to compute the, the actual homotopy type. You don't have to compute it. We know the formula. We know the exact formula and it's this one, okay? Well, if we are talking about homotopy type, this one is the formula. If we are all, uh, talking in terms of common homology, this is the formula. Okay, and uh, the next natural question is, okay, and what happens if we remove here the condition of the link to be semi-adequate? What happens? 
And the answer is that, yes, we can study that, but now we don't have a partial presimplicial set. We know how to do this, even if it is not a partial presimplicial set. And this is a result, uh, this is a joint paper with uh, Federico Cantero that we put in archive in a short time ago. And now it has been recently accepted, so we are very happy. <laughs> and what we did, we consider a Kovanov, uh, the functor defined, Kovanov functor defined by the Lisbeth and Sarkar, and we uh, construct, we define an analogous functor from the cube category to the Burnside category in such a way that this functor is simpler in some way, and we are able to decompose it into simplicial complexes. So then uh, we develop some scaling sequences. And well, by working with that, we are able to prove um, some results concerning the homotopy type of the of any diagram in semi in almost extreme gradients. Okay, and one of the theorems we prove is that if you have a diagram in such a way that when you smooth everything following a zero or an A label, you don't have this situation. This uh, um, two chords having uh, with their endpoints um, alternating along the boundary, then if the diagram is semi-adequate, we get the results I have just told you before. And if the diagram is not semi-adequate, then the homotopy type of the thing, let's say of the space we get here, is always a wedge of spheres. So we have no torsion. Okay, so the only way Today, you get torsion is with semi adequate diagrams or when you have this situation. But if you, uh, if you don't have this situation, then what you get is either a semi adequate diagram, so uh, suspension of projective planes and wedge of spheres, or if the diagram is not semi adequate, then you get just a wedge of spheres. So, um, this also. Uh, this fact, we have other results simplifying um, computations of uh, comotopy type, let's say, or of Kovanov spectrum. And this is what I wanted to tell you. Now, uh, the next goal will be deepen in J degree and see uh, what can we say uh, if we go further and further from the top and the bottom. So, uh, this was what I wanted to tell you today. Uh, thank you.